title of this video will be uh, Disappointment with God. The concept of this idea flows with the idea that people often are disappointed with life and they usually transfer that disappointment in life to disappointment with God. Now where I learned these ideas or at least sparked my interest in it was actually from a book. The title of the book is Disappointment with God uh, written by Philip Yancey. Now, he's not a Bible believer. You can see that as you read his writings. He claims or he says that he came out of, I think it's a fundamental Baptist church. Uh, but it's many, many years ago. And uh, evidently, possibly, the Lord hasn't revealed to him about the perfection of the King James Bible. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the Lord did give him uh valid information, and this tells you and I that you ought not just limit yourself to your small little camp. In fact, the Lord Jesus stated in Matthew 23, verse 2, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So the Lord was advising people to observe <clears throat> what the Pharisees were saying, but don't do their works. And these Pharisees, some of them were flesh and blood men, but some of them were actually devils, walking, talking devils that shape-shifted to, to appear to be men. So the idea there is that we ought to seek uh, truth uh, from any source, and you might realize that the Lord is willing to give truth to somebody outside of your camp. And so I'm, I'm very appreciative of the information that was given to Philip Yancey that he wrote a book entitled Disappointment of God. It has helped me tremendously, so I'm, I'm praying that it uh, might be a blessing and help to you. I'm going to start with Ezekiel chapter 33. You have <clears throat> Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Of course, Lamentations is squeezed between Jeremiah and Ezekiel. But uh, these are inst uh, valuable books in that uh, those three men were... Uh, associated or affected, probably is a better word, by the three military campaigns that Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon uh, attacked Jerusalem. On the first one, Daniel was taken captive back to uh, Iraq or Babylon and many other people. Uh, Eleven years later was the second military campaign, and that's when Ezekiel was a part of the ones who were taken captive back to Babylon and attempted to brainwash these people or to assimilate them into the Babylonian culture. And then five years later, after an 18-month siege, is the third and final military campaign, and that involved Jeremiah, and he chose to remain in Jerusalem. Now, Ezekiel was a priest over there in Babylon, and eventually 4,600 people were taken over there, and they had a common uh, complaint against God. They were very obviously very disappointed that uh, they were taken captive back to Babylon, and mm, probably many of their friends and family were killed back there in Jerusalem. And in that disappointment, as often things do, uh, people transfer this disappointment in life to disappointment with God. Now, a lot of believers don't want to admit that, but hey, that's just the way things are. If you personally have obviously been disappointed or upset or disagreed with your own earthly or natural parents, no doubt you would have the same feelings towards your supernatural God. So hopefully this uh, might be a blessing and a help to some. And usually when you get dealing with uh, people who are disappointed with God, uh, that they will bring up three basic questions or accusations against God. Okay, Some of them, 
Now, atheists do not expect anything from God, and they receive nothing from God, at least in their mind. Therefore, they are not disappointed with God. But believers expect something in return uh, for following the Lord. And that's not an unworthy expectation, but that's just a common thing. And so if things don't turn out the way a person <clears throat> believes they should, they can quickly be disappointed with God. And one of the accusations against God will be that he is unfair. God is unfair. He's not judging evil. He's not rewarding good in the time that I would like him to do it. <clears throat> God is unfair. In Ezekiel 33, this is the one accusation that these people back in Babylon had against God. In verse 17, the Lord says, Yet the children of thy people say the way of the Lord is not equal, but as for them, their way is not equal. Okay, so they're, what they're saying is God is not fair. And then God is turning around and saying to them, well, I'm fair. You're the one that's unfair. Now, on probably the second video, we'll, we'll look at the, the unfairness that these people had, second or third. We'll just see how it plays out. But this one accusation will be that God is unfair. Now, that, that is the basic idea that the three uh, friends— uh, came to Job, and of course with friends like them, who needs enemies, is that the theology of their day was that if you lived righteously, you can expect material blessings. And of course, you know, generally that would, was true. And so when Job was suffering, they concluded that he must be unrighteous. And Job defended himself in that discussion, and none of them knew about the actual contest between God and Satan, the one in chapter 1 and 2. And when actually, uh, because of Job did not sin with his lips, God won both contests. And then when God finally speaks, he doesn't even bring up to Job why he did what he did to him. But uh, just God speaking to Job was enough was enough to satisfy. So the one accusation against God will be that he is unfair. Another one will be, well, God is silent. Man concludes that either God is weak or uncaring since he does not intervene. An atheist concludes that God does not exist uh, because he doesn't intervene. Of course, this brings a, a host of inconsistencies. And the third accusation will be that God is hidden. God's hiding. Okay, and yes, there are times that God does hide. And in Isaiah 45, verse 15, the Lord said this, Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel the Savior. And the Lord did warn Israel in Deuteronomy that, uh, he was going to hide himself, uh, and of course, the ultimate hiding he's going to do will be in the uh, beginning portion of the tribulation time period. So he said in Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 31, uh, verse 17, he forewarned them about this, this hiding of God. And he said, then my anger shall be kindled against them that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us. So yes, there, there are times that God will hide. Now he says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 11, that his commandment is not hidden. And the hidden wisdom of God, according to 1 Corinthians 2, is readily available to the one who searches it out. But these are three accusations that people will have that God is unfair, God is silent, God is hidden. And the implications are that, are that uh, if God would intervene for them fairly, as they think he should, 
and uh, made himself known to them, then they would believe in him and follow him. So that's the accusations. Now, God is falsely accused uh, in these three accusations. Okay, you have different uh, false portrayals of God is that he's a strict bully ready to pounce at any disobedience. From the testimony that I heard from the author of the book, Disappointment of God, that's the kind of church he seemed to have was raised in. Okay, and unfortunate as it is, but uh, we should still try to overcome the misconceptions that believers uh, portray about God. Another false accusation against God is that he's uncaring, he's uh, unchangeable, you're not going to change his uh, ideas, you know, and he's uncharitable. And uh, then others will say he's permissive and weak. No, the, the God of the Bible is caring, he's colorful, he's compassionate, and a unique person or God. Uh, according to Nehemiah 9, he's merciful and mighty. Those are opposite extremes, okay? Merciful and mighty. Mighty uh, is usually like a bully or they got power, but Jesus is merciful, hence he's not a bully. In John 1.14, uh, uh, John described the Lord to be full of grace and truth. Those are, again, opposites of the perspective, Grace and truth. A person is usually strict on their truth is not real gracious. And a person who's real gracious is, is not usually uh, solid in their truth. Uh, the Lord Jesus is full of grace and truth. And then Jonah was upset with God because he was ready and willing to pardon the Ninevites. Now, Jonah would have greatly appreciated that God would be ready and willing to pardon him, but he just didn't want God to pardon uh, the Ninevites, who were the enemies of Israel. You know, some people tend to think that Jonah was afraid to go there. Uh, no, I don't believe he, he was afraid at all. He didn't want to go there. And when he said 40 days that will destroy, he, he got his calendar out and started mark, marking off the days, hoping it, that, that it would happen. The God of the Bible has deep emotions of delight and grief. And yes, a born-again believer can grieve his God. And God is grieved and shocked, actually, with certain behavior how people uh, down the road of a reprobate mind will treat others. And this is one of the amazing things in Jeremiah 19. He described those people before they were judged by God. And if you and I read that, we would clearly say God was absolutely right in judging those people, but yet they felt God was unfair. Now, people in the Bible who seem to relate to God the best uh, treated him as a familiar friend. And one of them was actually called the friend of God, Abraham. When you see Abraham and Moses and David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then Peter, James, and John, and Paul, they, they treated God, or the Lord, as a familiar friend. Now, I see uh, the Lord is um, testing man, and God himself desperately uh, wants to love and to be loved, just as you and I do. And when uh, God created the world, uh, he, like a excited child drawing his first or second or third portrait or learning how to write, or uh, maybe like the uh, you know, little girl that made her first cookies or possibly a young girl who learned how to make clothes uh, a seamstress, maybe the first time, or a kid, maybe the first time he's playing a sport or he's getting better at the sport, or he's learning how to ride a bike, and he may excitedly go to his parents, wasn't that good? Wasn't that good? Uh, when God uh, created uh, the world after Satan destroyed it from his destruction of, I suppose, Atlantis, after the first day, it says it was good. 
And God, like a child, oh, that was good. And then day three, he repeats that. That was good. And day four, oh, man, that's good. And then day five, day four, when he created the, the sun, moon, and stars, you know, he created the earth, you know, it was already there. Uh, and then he created light on the earth. Uh, but yet, uh, he didn't create the sun until the fourth day. So I'm kind of curious, possibly, you know, what the earth... Um, uh, possibly traveled around when uh, the sun and moon weren't were, were not here, but it would, uh, that's something to think about. But uh, the Lord was excited about uh, this creation, and in fact, the angels, uh, kind of like cheerleaders, were singing uh, God's praises. You know, He makes this hippopotamus, and He says, and they say, "Wow, look at that! Isn't that neat, man? That is something. Never seen anything like that before." You know, and then and when he brought these animals to Adam to start naming them and, and put them in, you know, certain uh, species and all those things. And Adam comes across that that hippopotamus and he says, whoa, we uh, what do I call that? Well, I think I'll call that a hippopotamus. And then the Lord says, why are you going to call it that? He said, well, I've never seen anything look like that before. So I think it's a hippopotamus. I certainly hope that thing doesn't get chapped lips. That sure would be a problem. And then this uh, giraffe shows up. He says, whoa, look at that thing. Uh, boy, that is neat. I uh, hope that thing don't get a sore throat. Uh, but, and, but the Lord was excited about his creation. And, and then when he got all them animals and he made them male and female, those animals, he, he looked at them things and he knows that those animals were going to uh, comply with his wishes. <clears throat> and, and then he's like, I don't have anything like me. I need to create something like me. Now, those, those exciting emotions uh, when somebody says what you have done, man, that's good. That is good. It produces a natural dopamine. And when people admire your abilities or your achievement or your creation, you know, whether it's a painting or your craftsman or performer or, you know, whatever. And, and the Lord said, man, that's good. That's good. Now, all the animals and the plants uh, mindlessly follow the natural laws. You know, animals uh, at youth, they're at play. They're playing all the time with all that energy. They reveal the joy of creation at its youth, youth and everything. And after the creation of the animals, uh, none of them look like God. So God said to Son and the Holy Ghost, hey, let us create one like us. Now, God could have simply created a perfect world that works like a perfect machine as it is programmed. Uh, but the Lord uh, would like some fellowship. He would like a friend. You know, a child, a little girl or a little boy can enjoy a toy for a time but eventually they lose interest in that toy because they want some love reciprocated to them. And a toy can't do that. And so the Lord, okay, creates Adam. And in this unique creation, uh, he created a cr creation in Adam with freedom, a free will to rebel against his creator. Now, this introduction of freedom introduced the risk of evil. Will this special creation choose to love God? Can love and friendship arise out of freedom? It's like a man who is a sculptor, and then when he's done, that what he had sculpted can spit at him. Or the doll, the dolly, can run away from the little girl. Or the little army G.I. Joes can actually shoot back at the boy. And when God set up things up for Adam and Eve, and God disappointedly realized that Adam has rejected what he said, you see, God walked with Adam and gave him the choice. And Adam chose 
And God, like a parent, directly intervened. Did he not? Did not? God experienced sadness over a broken relationship. And God displayed anger at their denials and excuses, like a parent would. God experienced rejection from a loved one. Now, God was not silent. He was not hidden to Adam. And, of course, there was nothing that he had to be fair about because there was no sin at the time. But now, since Adam has rebelled against his God, now God had to introduce punishment. You see, God was not silent or hidden from Adam that people claim they want from God. But the first test reveals that man will still reject what God wants, even when God is right there. Adam soon learned that rebellion seems like freedom, but it has its limitations. You see, the first test exposed man's accusations against God are false. You see, man says, well, if God would be fair or if God would be make himself known to me, if I would go out someplace and say, God, show yourself, you know, uh, show yourself to me so I know that you're there. Uh, what would man do? The same thing Adam would do. You see, the couple of the attributes of God is that he is merciful and mighty. If he is just mighty, then he's not merciful. If he's just merciful, then he's not mighty. No, the God of the Bible is merciful and mighty. Can you see the predicament that God is in? For example, if a king, who is a very strict king, uh, sees a commoner, a young lady going by, and he falls in love with the commoner, now what does he do? I mean, the king is like no other king. You see people tremble at his power. No one dares to breathe a word against him, for he had the strength to crush all his opponents. Yet this mighty king's heart melted for the love of a humble maiden. How could he declare his love for her? In an odd sort of way, his kingliness tied his hands. His power, his might tied his hands. If he brought her to the palace and crowned her with jewels and clothed her with royal robes, she would surely not resist. Who would dare resist? But would she love him? She would say she loved him because of his might, but would she be true? Or would she live with him in fear, nursing a private grief for the life she had left behind? Would she be happy at his side? How could he know? If he rode his royal carriage into the commoner's location with armed escorts, that would overwhelm her. He did not want a cringing subject. He wanted a lover equal to him. He wanted her to love him voluntarily at an equal status with him. So what could he do? Well, what he did is that he gave up his royal garbs and disguised him as a commoner and sought to win her love voluntarily, not knowing who he was. You know, that sounds sort of kind of like a story I know in the Bible. And this is one of the reasons that man is disappointed with God is because he's not looking at it from God's perspective. And so I hope that this was kind of laid a foundation on this because I want to go further into this idea. And a person just, you are better off to be honest with God with your words because he's reading your heart anyway. When you're disappointed with things in life, lay it at the feet of God. 
casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you.